Hello and welcome back to the Galway Film Pla and to this morning's screening of Breaking Ice. Um, my name is Will Fitzgerald, programmer here at the FLA, and I'm delighted to present this documentary to you this afternoon. I hope you all enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, and it's my pleasure now to be joined uh, by the director, Jason Brannigan, and by some of the uh, original crew from the 1988 uh, Winter Olympics Irish bobsleigh team. Um, we have, I actually lost my picture, <laughs> but I, is it my understanding that understanding we have, that we have uh, Larry? Larry, are you there? Yes, I'm here. And we have Pat? Yep. And we have Jerry? I think Jerry, Jerry j just waiting to get, get, get in. We're, we've lost Jerry and we have Cormac. You have indeed. How are you? How are we doing, lads? Thanks a million for joining us. Pleasure. Uh, brilliant documentary, Jason. Well done. Um, you know, in a kind of summer where we've had to go without sports so far, it's been a, a pleasure to be able to sit down on a Sunday morning um, and enjoy a, a thrilling sports journey like this one. Um, tell us, how did you, why this story and how did you come to tell it? Um, so I, I, I didn't know about this story prior, prior to February 2018. It was kind of during the last Winter Games and there was a, an article I came across online and it mentioned that 2018 should have been the 30th anniversary of um, Ireland's Winter Olympic debut, kind of how it didn't happen. And I, I kind of done a little bit of digging and basically what I began to realize was kind of every four years, one or two articles would appear. And it mentioned that the first time like, we, we had went to a Winter Games was in a bobsleigh. Grown up, I guess I was of the age where Cool Runnings was a big film and it kind of tripped me out that I didn't know we had a team who uh, had qualified for the same games and that it was our first time, I suppose, competing in a Winter Olympics. There was something about it that just grabbed me. So I kind of very quickly start trying to see whether I could find any of the athletes and Larry was the first person I touched base with. Brilliant, fair play. And Larry, as the, the documentary kind of tells us, it already started with you. It was This was your idea to put together a, an Irish bobsleigh team, of all things. That's that, that's right. Um, it really was my wife who started it. She she sent me on something in, in San Moritz to drive a bobsleigh, a course, and I did that. And then we were on a skiing holiday in Austria. So I went up to the track at Eagles and um, I wanted to drive that. And it was a much much easier course to drive than San Moritz had a bit of a reputation. And they said, no, 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 you don't drive here. Only international drivers. Hi, Larry. So, um, so that's what we did. We became international drivers. Brilliant. Um, then it, sorry, then it, became obvious, it became obvious then that once we'd set the team up, that, you know, going to Eagles wasn't the, wasn't the ambition. It was going to the Olympics became the ambition. And tell me about like recruiting uh, a bunch of rowers to make up this team. Well, that was my background, and um, the the history of bobsleigh in the history of bobsleigh that in 1964, actually in Eagles, um, the Britain won the gold medal in the two man bob, and the guy who was driving it was a rower from Marlow, and the guy who was breaking it was. Um, from Northern Ireland, Robin Dixon, Nash and Dixon. So, um, yeah, it, being my background, that's where I that's where I could sort of get it easier to relate to athletes from from that background. Yeah, and it makes sense to go from there. Um, I think we've just been joined by Jerry, have we? He's not, Maybe not, not all the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, Pat, if I can ask you, you know, one of the highlights every year uh, here of the Galway Film Plot is um, the, the crack and the talking about the films afterwards in the rowing club. I wonder, had you guys ever been uh, in your capacity as, as rowers through the years? Uh, to the rowing club in Galway? Yeah. Yeah, well, we had, we used to be a very uh, strong event down there, the Galway head of the river, which every club in Ireland nearly attended. It was massive weekend around Paddy's weekend and uh, in there many a time yeah and what do you feel uh, your background in rowing brought to this you know endeavor to become a bobsleigh team well we were fairly we were fit which was the main thing I suppose and uh, 
I, I, I can remember uh, when the first time I kind of got any involvement in bobsleigh was when we were rowing in Henley at a, the, we were competing in an event called the Ladies' Plate, which was really for universities and top clubs. The next step down to international teams. And I remember going training one day and there was a, a note on the boat that which was left there by Larry introducing Oxley more or less and asking if any athletes wanted to get involved. And I was probably, probably one of the oldest guys in the crew. And I was from, uh, getting towards my late 20s. And I was thinking, you know, yeah, Oxley, because I'd seen it a few times before. I think it was the Sarajevo games that I'd seen, which would have been two years before. Um, and I kind of had this thing in the back of my mind that clicked and said, yeah, I would really love to try that. So I took the phone number down after the training session. And then before we went on to compete in the semi-final and final, I rang Larry and I told him I was interested. And that uh, it kind of left me at that point because the whole competition in Henley took over at that point. You know, we got to the final and we won it. But uh, then Larry came along after we'd won the race and introduced himself and uh, I more or less went on from there. We kind of connected with phone numbers and then the arrangement was made that we would go to the club school in November, the end of October, oh, yeah. November in, in 86. That's really where they start there. History was made. Um, Cormac, tell us about, because you know the film doesn't shy away, especially it kind of sets us up in the early parts to show us how dangerous uh, this really is. Um, like, where does the, where do you pull the courage from to, to jump into that thing and, uh, you know, to compete with your life in your hands? I'm not quite sure. I think I seem to remember saying in the film that uh, when I first did it, it frightened the BJs out of me. Um, <laughs> it is a, um, it is a particularly, um, uh, from my memory, certainly at first to particularly frighten. It's a sport where you have to overcome your fears and control your fear to do it. There's a great amount of adrenaline involved. Um, and um, I don't know, it's just, um, I mean, you know, I was there, I was, I don't know, 24, 25 years of age with this fantastic opportunity. And you look around at guys like, you know, Larry and Pat and Jerry and that, and you don't want to let yourself down in front of them. You know, you've got to kind of, you've got a front up. So it's just a, it's a competitive thing. It's like yeah. any other sport, but I'd say, I mean, certainly for me, the fear factor was bigger than any other sport that I ever competed in. Yeah, I can well imagine. We, see, we saw some of the, the bruises and the damage inflicted there uh, during the film. And it was also, there was a, a real sort of bittersweet moment. Uh, Jerry, I don't know if you can hear me now at this point. But, I can uh, hear you, can like, you hear me? Oh. Fantastic. Yeah, we can hear you. Um, there's that great uh, recreation scene that Jason did with the, the newsreader uh, talking about 88, of course, and what was going on in the background. Uh, I suppose the background for you guys, because you were doing your thing, was, of course, you know, Jack Charlton and the other boys in green, um, which is a bittersweet moment, I suppose, given the events of the, um, of the past day. Um, was there that sense even back then that even though you were doing this amazing Olympics, uh, you know, you were going to compete in the Olympics, but I suppose it was overlooked still in, as, a, as a sport in Ireland. Yeah, I, I just think it's, it's very hard to explain the sport because it's just completely different than anything we ever did before. I mean, the whole winter experience is something that Irish people are used to. And yeah, the whole Eddie the Eagle business and I suppose the Jamaican bobsled team, a little bit of that we were concerned of it, that we weren't being taken seriously, you know, and it's only when people go out and actually see it, say, geez, my God, you know, that's pretty impressive to even to do it. So it's a bit like, like what Cormac was talking about. So our big fear was, you know, obviously not to make a show of ourselves and be able to compete. And we were able to prove that. Um, and I, I think people in Ireland just couldn't get their heads around sport. You know, there was a, a certain amount of ignorance there. I, I think I might have re referred to that, but just, it was so bizarre and different. It just, like, what the hell are these guys doing? You know, completely <laughs> bizarre. But it's only when you get there. And when we went to the Olympics, I remember my friends and family members who went out and just stood beside the track, they just couldn't believe it. They actually had their heads inside. There's a kind of a, a guard on the track. 
So they put their heads inside to get a closer look. And when the first ball went by, they took their heads out and stood well back. <laughs> so, uh, as I say, it's just, it's, it's very hard to explain. It's, it's, it's completely different. And for, you know, such a slow moving sport like rowing and a lot of hard work to go from that into this more or less, it's like driving a fighter pilot, you know, or being a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a jet plane. It's just yeah. brilliant and crazy, you know. And yeah, everything too I, is, I mean, you know, what, once you're at the top, you're not going to try and say, geez, I'm not going to do this. You're kind of like, you don't let yourself down or your, 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 your break man or, or your rest of your teammates. So look, it's a challenge is there. So let's get at it. Let's do it. And, you know, it's, it was good fun. Scary, but kind of yeah. rewarding having, having got down alive. So I was, I was okay, get down safe. <laughs> you know. Well, fair play to you. You did it and it made for a brilliant story. Um, and Jason, you know, I, you had a lot of fun, I feel, as a viewer with the making of this film as well. I mean, the way you wove in the, um, you know, um, the recreations to tell the story, the, it was quite uh, kind of cheeky at points, um, especially uh, when you revealed to the audience, you know, that this is how it should have gone. Use of animation was brilliant as well. I think, was it Rachel Fitzgerald was the artistic director? Maybe tell us a bit about weaving those elements in. Yeah, so I, I guess, Going into this at the beginning, um, it became pretty apparent that at the time there there hadn't been huge amounts of coverage, so we knew we wouldn't have massive amounts of <laughs> archive to uh, at, at the beginning. So I suppose what we always thought or what I, I felt going in was that we needed to be able to make it work something kind of similar to, to maybe what Alex Fagan was able to do with the Irish pub or Alden Ireland work by um, talking heads and strong narrative can carry everything through. So initially we, we just dug into speaking with all of the guys and actually figuring out what the story was going to be. And we got very lucky that Terry McHugh had a like old high eight camera at the time. And he had captured huge amounts of footage from when everyone was out training and out competing. But what became kind of apparent at a certain stage was that we just didn't have there was there was elements of the story that we weren't able to tell visually and we knew we were going to need to do that so that's how the idea of the animated sequences i suppose um entered the fold whereas there was just moments that we wanted to show you what what that kind of what had happened or how it maybe felt and we couldn't do that visually and we didn't have the money to go out to a bob track in europe or something and film so animation became our means of, of telling parts of the story visually. And yeah. Rachel is obviously a phenomenal animator and she done an incredible job. And I think those sequences, everyone compliments them. They elevate kind of the story we were telling in a different capacity. They had another layer to it. And in terms of the newscaster, and that, that idea came about because again, it, it was, I suppose, a creative, necessity as finding a way of weaving a, a particular thread maybe parts of the story that we we thought we didn't have captured or told in the right way and for me it just felt like it's still kind of crazy like to to date I've yet to speak with someone and they and tell them this story and they can sit back and say to me oh yeah I remember that or I know that thing happened so that, that little moment with the newscaster kind of at the end, just, I, I, I guess, personally, I just wanted to make a point um, that I think it's an incredible story and it, it should have been told long before I, I was able to maybe come in and, and, and do it. So that's... Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but again, great job in, in um, you know, the way you structured it and delivered it. Um, Larry, was this your first time watching the film back or have you all gotten to have a screening at some point together? No, I, I've seen it a few times now, and uh, he's, Jason did a remarkable job. He's a tremendous storyteller. He's a very talented guy. Absolutely. Pat, does it like transport you back to, you know, the day? Um, I mean, there's terrific use of archive footage yeah, and everything in there. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, sometimes you look back at the 80s and think, God, oh, that was a terrible time, you know, maybe it was economically, but boy, we had some fun in the 80s. It was just an incredible time in my life, anyway, all of the 80s. So, um, yeah, it was, it was 
huge, huge memories from it, you know, and we made so many great friends by doing it as well. And it was just a great time. And, uh, yeah. you know, it was, weren't we lucky that we met Larry? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, that he left that note. Yeah. Um, very sweet tribute to you there as well at the end of the film, Larry. Um, I'd like to ask each of you, you know, um, perhaps a bit cheekily, um, what do you think of uh, the film Cool Runnings? <laughs> Where do Anyone we start? want to volunteer? <laughs> well, I, I, from my point of view, we met all those guys that actually did it. And they're a lovely bunch of fellas, great athletes. And they didn't achieve kind of the results that are shown in that film. But they were, you know, they were just a really nice bunch of guys that took the sport very seriously. And it was just unusual, even for us. I mean, our weather isn't cold enough to compete in, in our country. But for those guys, it was just amazing <laughs> how they could actually put up with that change of weather from Jamaica to the actual runs was incredible. But they were a great bunch of fellas. Great fellas. They, they also made a fortune. Um, the, the guy that John Candy played, I mean, the, everybody was wearing the, the sweatshirts with the palm trees and the bob flying through it. So they made a, a lot of money on the merchandising. But there's actually a better group, Pat, if you remember, Larry, the, the four Mexican brothers. Remember those two guys? It was four brothers. Yeah. And they had a Volkswagen van and they drove all the way from Mexico City up to Calgary, right through America. Uh, and the four, a tow the four man pub behind. I don't yeah. know what happened to them, how they did, but I remember they meeting them anyway. They were characters. The Jamaican sounds like another movie in the making, guys. Sorry, go ahead, Larry. Yeah, I've, I've watched I've watched Cool Runnings a few times and I enjoy it each time. Um, but the, we, when we were at the Olympics in Salt Lake City in 2002, when um, the a, a skeleton rider came forth, the Jamaicans actually broke the track record um, for the start. So their sprinters got them, got them off the start faster than any, any other team in the competition. They didn't win it, they didn't place, but they did take, and, and in bobsleigh, the, um, the first 50 meter time for the, for the athletes, for a lot of the athletes, that's more important than the bottom time because th th that's their contribution it, it is, is getting uh, the, the very fastest start. And, uh, and Jamaica took the track record. So they, they, um, they're an impressive bunch of guys. And yeah, they're still yeah, yeah. No more than yourselves. Um, and uh, I also wanted to ask each of you, you know, looking at this film, um, like I said at the beginning, we've kind of, it's, it's been a treat to have uh, some sport to watch on a Sunday morning again. We're living through this um, summer without sport. Um, how, like what's, what do you guys see as the effect of uh, a period like this? Um, you know, the pandemic, lockdown, athletes haven't been able to, to get out and practice. Um, any particular uh, feelings, you're relieved things are opening up again? Um, Cormac, maybe if we start with you and we'll kind of work around. Um, well, it's a long time since I would call myself an athlete. Um, the lockdown <laughs> has cost me the lockdown has cost me at least a stone, stone and a half. Well, say a stone. Um, no, I mean, I think um, my own personal view is that this is a thing that we're all going to have to learn to live with for a long, long time. Um, I think it has been particularly um, um, uh, um, unfortunate the effect it's had on sport as in other parts of life. Personally, I'm waiting for my gym to reopen so I can um, get the body moving again. But I just think that there's a, you know, there's an awful lot of different considerations um, to be had. It's very unfortunate. At the end of the day, there are more important things than sport. And the people I really feel for are the people that are gonna lose their jobs, the people that, um, you know, have families are maybe gonna lose their mortgage because of the economic knock-ons. Uh, you know, and of course, the people who have died and who have lost loved ones. So yes, it's unfortunate that sport has been um, haltered in the way that it has, but actually there really is um, far more important things I think to be concerned with. But yeah, I suppose like everyone, I just hope we can get back to some semblance of normality as soon as possible. Yeah. Larry, yourself, are you looking forward to any particular uh, tournaments or Olympic games in the future? Um, 
it was good when the golf came back. The, uh, <laughs> Rory, the, he, he, he brought them back. It, it, it was, that was kind of the start of, of watching sport again. And it's, it's, picking, it's picking up now. Um, I was up early watching New Zealand rugby when that came, when, you know, the first weekend that was on. But, but I haven't watched it since. So I was desperate to see the first game. Um, but there's quite a few sports now. Uh, I'm. It, it's wretched for the uh, for the sports people, particularly the ones who train for this year's Olympics. But as Cormac said, it's you know it's not the end of the world. Sports not the end of the world, and some people are dealing with the end of the world. Yeah, absolutely. And then at the same token, Jerry, for some people, for people who've trained and have a goal like you guys did, it must be devastating at the same time. Yeah, I I, I think. Um... You know, particularly like rowing, that we, the, our female scholar, Sunita Pushpura, you know, she's world champion the last two years and, she, and she's in her late 30s now. There's hope. It would be lovely to see her win an Olympic medal. And I hope not just because time is against her, but maybe she'll prove us all wrong and I hope she does. But I think the other thing is, and it's kind of the corollary to what Cormac was saying, that how important sport is in all our lives. And it's, it's, it's kind of, it's there in the background all the time and you kind of forget about it. It's only when it's taken away you miss it now. You know, I don't. I've fallen out of love with soccer, but I like, like Larry, I love the rugby. I just like the, the gladiatorial contest. But I was looking forward to Leinster beating the crap out of those <laughs> <and Sarah's. laughs> that, which will probably happen anyway. You know, if there's any God out there, any justice out there, Leinster have to win that semi or quarter final and hopefully go on and win the double again. But, uh, I uh, I miss the rugby big time. You know. Uh, and as I say, but it's given them a lot of chance to to get healthy again because they're always kind of injured, you know. So possibly trying to kind of get that break from the sport actually might help them in a way. But I feel like Larry, I feel sorry for the people who, because we know from rowing how hard and how hard they train now. It's we thought we trained hard, but it's the sport has just gone mad now in terms of the physical preparation. And uh, you know, it's just it's very tough not to be able to go out and, and compete and perform. It must be difficult for them you know but that's maybe an all sport absolutely yeah. yeah the break might actually be that there are some benefits i suppose pat would you agree well yeah the benefit for me really was how closer you you become your own family and your friends you know you thanks to zoom maybe but um i think people the good came out in people there was something that had to be fought and everybody put up a great fight against it you know and looking back on it out some people made some terrible decisions, but uh, you just have to get on with it. You know, when you look at different governments around the place and the, the number of deaths, it's really hard. It's heartbreaking, you know, but I think Karma kind of summed it up there in a nutshell. Sport is a great thing, but there are other things that are that bit more serious that have to be taken more serious that we all have to fight against. And uh, in terms of rowing, again, I think, Okay, you miss out on a year, it's hard, and it's hard for everybody uh, involved in rowing, in particular, uh, as in, as we had the athletes who were probably two gold medals at the last World Championships, silver, you know, so I think the same people are still very young, and it's, uh, they'll be able to keep it going, I think, for till yeah, next yeah. year. You know, the fact that that's, they're in that league now, I think that they, you know, they will keep it going, hopefully. But uh, Hopefully. all in all, I think uh, it's it's been a strange time and I hope we can kind of get through it. And it did highlight a lot of the things that aren't that important really and tend to have far too much importance. I, I put the like to soccer number one there. I didn't miss it a bit. In fact, I prefer to watch it now without the sound, so. <laughs> <laughs> So I probably always did, but I do. I I personally miss the Gaelic football. And I hope oh, we get yeah. back. And I hope we get back to it. Don't we all? And the hurling as well. Yeah. Uh, Jason, just by way of wrapping up, um, you know, obviously, I suppose the pandemic has put uh, a crimp in your plans for the film. Um, I hope it finds loads of success after the FLA and on the big screen as well. Um, have you used this time to develop any future projects? Um, yeah, I guess a, a little bit. There's there's a couple of things I'd like to maybe try and get off the ground over the next six months, twelve months. We'll see how how things kind of shape up. It's one of those 
I think everyone is still eagerly kind of watching and checking trades to see what's back filming and how they're doing it. And there's just such a big question mark, I guess, as to when everyone in the industry will be able to get back to work. Um, so it's been it's been lovely to kind of have that time to, to do a little bit of work. But I'm, I'm also kind of, I would love to get back at it and actually be able to stand on a set again and actually start doing what, what I love doing. Um, so yeah, we I guess we'll we'll see what comes next, but there's there's a couple of things I I would love to try to get off ground as I'm sure every other filmmaker uh, you've spoken to over the last week um, has said as well. Well, at least you have a, a great film uh, to come out swinging with um, when uh, the markets and the festivals and cinemas are open again. Uh, congratulations again, uh, brilliant story, well told. Really enjoyed it, and thanks to yourself and thanks. Uh, Cormac, Larry, Jerry, Pat, uh, for joining us and for being part of the, the 2020 Galway Film Club. Cheers, lads. Thank you. Thank you. And can I just say one last thing? Sure. I just want to say congratulations to you. Uh, you guys were able to pull out this digital edition in <laughs> no time at all, and it's been brilliant. And for us, Galway was always, a, it's, I think, every Irish filmmaker's target annually, and there was a real concern that we would miss it this year. So just want to round of applause to you and the team because uh, yeah, making it happen has been great. And I know it's brought huge amounts of joy to Irish filmmakers and film fans. Oh, well, thanks Thank a million. That's, it's our pleasure. Cheers. Thanks again. Thanks for sharing your film with us. Take thanks. it easy, lads. Bye. All the best. Bye, Larry. Bye.